Yes. Um, Lord Watergrave, we'd reached your written answer of June 1991 yesterday afternoon where the, the, the line was held in terms of the existing policy. If we can pick matters up next in August of 1991, Lawrence, could we have DHSC 0046973 underscore 035, please? Uh, you'll see this is a minute dated the 19th of August 1991. It's from the Parliamentary Under Secretary's uh, office to your private office. Uh, so that would have been, I think, Mr. Dorrell. Mm -hmm. um, please find attached a submission from Mr. Canavan. PSH thinks that this is an issue on which S of S would wish to take the decision. And then if we look at the uh, attached submission, it's at DHSC 0003641 underscore 004. The submission itself from Mr. Canavan is dated the 13th of August 1991, uh, addressed to uh, PSH's mm -hmm. office. Uh, I think we need only look for present purposes at paragraphs one and three. So if you can scroll down slightly, please, Lawrence. So paragraph one says, PSH may recall that Graham Ross of J. Keith Park & Co. has written to ministers on several occasions pressing for compensation for the blood transfusion recipients infected with HIV. With ministers' agreement, officials have taken over the correspondence. Graham Ross expressed some concern at this, but has been assured that ministers will be told of any new arguments. This submission concerns, uh, uh, considers a point of particular concern to Mr Ross, that preserving the anonymity of blood donors could make it difficult for the blood transfusion recipients to seek redress through the courts. Uh, and then in the third part, oh, sorry, I'll, for the completeness, I'll read the second. In the submission, we're also reporting the RHAs, that's regional health authorities, willingness to take the lead in negotiating a deal to settle the blood transfusion issue should ministers wish to seek such a settlement. And then the recommendation in paragraph three, we do not consider that these developments in themselves warrant a change in the government's position. However, should ministers be minded to seek a way of settling the blood transfusion issue, the J. Keith Park and RHA developments may be helpful in reducing the risk of wider repercussions. Um, the submission then goes on to set out in more detail the issue about um, anonymity of donors and, and the impact that might have on the ability to litigate. I'm not going to read any of that out. If we just go to page three, please. We pick it up at paragraph nine, conclusions, at the top of the page. In the view of officials, the arguments about donor anonymity do not warrant a concession to the blood transfusion recipients infected with HIV. However, if ministers were minded to seek a way of settling the issue, then the arguments might be used to present the settlement as a necessary measure to protect our voluntary blood donor system. However, any such argument would have to be used with caution, as any erosion of public interest immunity principle could have serious implications for all government departments and for other public bodies. There would need to be consultation with these other interests. And then if we go down to the bottom of the page under the heading decisions required, we are asking PSH whether one, he's content that officials should inform J. Keith, Park, J. Keith Park that the government's position on compensation for the blood transfusion cases is unchanged by the arguments about donor anonymity. Two, he wishes any further action taken at this stage to pursue the RHA's offer. Um, now, Lord Watergrave, as we saw from the covering submission, this appears to have been passed up the ministerial chain to you. But the documents, I think, don't tell us what, if any, decision you took in, in response to this. Do you have any independent recollection of it? No, I don't. Um, uh, uh, we didn't, at that point, change the policy, but we did later. Um, and I think there's then a gap in the available documentation um, in, in, uh, addressing this issue until we get to the end of November 1991, um, where we see that, um, uh, from documents, it's clear that your view has changed. Um, and so we'll pick up the, the story there. Um, DHSC 0002894 underscore 011, please. Um, so 
This is from Strawn Heppel to um, your private office, 28th of November 1991. If we look at the uh, text of the minute, it says, transplant, etc., patients with HIV. I attach a draft letter to the Chief Secretary on the lines we discussed. We shall need to bring the other health departments into the correspondence now, as we shall want them to bear their share of the cost. Meeting our share will put a considerable strain on our finances this year, but a settlement deferred to next year would, of course, be a less welcome offer to those concerned. Um, I'm just going to show you one further minute from Mr Heppel the following day and then ask you about it. So that, that's the 28th of November. 29th of November, we have um, DHSC 00002537 underscore 262. So the heading here, blood transfusion, etc. patients with HIV. Again, it's from Mr. Heppel, 29th of November, to your private office. Um, I attach a draft letter to the Chief Secretary on the lines we discussed. It offers a one-third contribution to the cost on the basis we might have to go to one-half. Secretary of State will want to reflect on the financial and policy aspects of the letter before he writes. On finances, the position is that we have already absorbed an extra £3 million for the haemophiliacs, as a consequence of higher costs and numbers than expected. Nevertheless, we can make some further contribution if that is what Secretary of State judges necessary to resolve the matter. There is inevitably some uncertainty about the final outturn this year, but £6 million can be guaranteed if Secretary of State is prepared to accept that this will use up all his personal fund. J just pausing there, what's the reference to the personal fund, Lord Waldegrave? There was a, a sort of small central fund to deal with um, particular issues that came up uh, from time to time smaller than these where uh, I thought we needed to take action. I've always thought in a department it's sensible to have what the officials would have referred to as a back pocket if there was something unexpected and relatively small that could be swiftly dealt with. And in, in relation to allocation from that personal fund, did that require Treasury agreement? Um, I think it depended on the scale of it. It was a very small fund. If it was a million pounds, perhaps. For example, there were regular issues surrounding the arrival of new and effective drugs that were very expensive um, for cancer treatment, for example. And sometimes uh, they came unexpectedly, and um, one would probably have been able to clear that at official level with the Treasury, say it was a million or two million pounds, um, uh, and just deal with it quickly. Um, and then continuing with the minute, we must also assume that Treasury would not entertain any further bids on the reserve for additional cases. On policy, this extension of eligibility will leave us with a less secure ring fence than for haemophiliacs. We believe that two groups of people, those infected with hepatitis and those treated with human growth hormone, are currently preparing legal action against the department. Both groups will be able to argue that, like the HIV cases, they were entitled to expect safe treatment, and the hepatitis cases will also be able to point to infection through blood. So we will be more vulnerable than we now are on the no-fault compensation issue. And then we can see, if we just go further down, that's the end of the minute. So um, it, it looks from those two documents, um, Lord Waldegrave, that by the end of November of 1991, you had taken the, the, the decision, discussed it with uh, um, Mr. Heppel, uh, others, uh, that the, uh, um, the time had come to change the departmental line and extend financial support to those infected with HIV through transfusion. Do you have any recollection of, of exactly how and when that came about? Because I say there's a, there's a dearth of documents really between August and November. No, no, I don't have any independent recollection, I'm afraid. The only comments I can make uh, are, of course, that um, there are two things. There's one important thing not in the documents, which is that I had secured a very favourable overall post settlement for the next year. It's not explained in these documents, but I did, and I remember uh, the chief executive of the National Health Service, um, Duncan Nicol, saying, well, that will keep us going for several years. Um, and that, on the, on the finance side, made me a little more generally confident, I think. On the other side, in the autumn, there are party conferences, there are, there's much um, external 
uh, work where you meet many, and then the summer you meet constituents and so on. So um, I think my own ideas, which had been clearly visible earlier on, will probably have been firmed up in, in August, September. Um, and then that takes us to um, the, the final version of what I think was probably the, the, the draft being referred to by Mr Heppel uh, in um, these minutes. And it's a letter you sent to Mr Mellor, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, on the 2nd of December. Uh, Lawrence, it is at DHSC 0002921 underscore 009. Um, and I'm going to read this in full because it effectively it, it provides, I think, the clearest indication of the, 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 the formal change of position. Um, so, dear Chief Secretary, blood transfusion, etc., patients with HIV. After last Thursday's Cabinet, we had a word about the continuing campaign on behalf of non-haemophiliac patients infected by HIV in the course of treatment, blood transfusion, transplant or tissue transfer in this country. I have looked very carefully at this. While I do not think the strength of the case or indeed its public support is the same as for the haemophiliacs, there is no doubt that there is considerable sympathy for these unfortunate <coughs> people or that a concession on our part would be widely welcomed. By contrast, if we continue to refuse any help, there is a real prospect that the campaign will gather pace and become a damaging and running sore over the next few months. My conclusion is that we should move now to resolve the matter by recognising the needs of these people and their families in the same way as we've recognised those of haemophiliacs. We could do this in one of two ways. First, by giving them the same as we gave to the haemophiliacs and their families in the out-of-court settlement. Second, by also giving them the earlier help provided to haemophiliacs, including, if we can arrange it, access to the original McFarlane Trust. This help was in practice, though not formally taken into account in arriving at the out-of-court settlement. Uh, over the page. Um, if we take the first approach, the estimated cost is £10 million. The second would cost an estimated £12 million and bring forward the time when the McFarland Trust will need topping up. But the cleanest way of resolving this is to go for the second, and I recommend we do that. A clean resolution will also mean dealing with the cases without any intrusive investigation into whether the infection may have arisen in another way. We did not carry out any such investigation with the haemophiliacs, but we will need to carry out some validation of the cases falling into new categories, though only as far as practicable and sensible. Applying those criteria to existing cases would give us about 75 cases which arose in the United Kingdom. The criteria will also mean accepting that there is likely to be a handful of cases in future years who will also be eligible for payment. As to the financing of this, I have already topped up the haemophiliacs money by £3 million because numbers and costs were higher than expected. Nevertheless, I am prepared to pay a third of the £12 million costs. I hope that the other health departments will be able to make a contribution in respect of cases arising in their countries and that it will be possible for the Treasury to meet the balance from the reserve. I am copying this to Peter Brook, David Hunt and Ian Lang. And that's Peter Brook, Northern Ireland, David Hunt, Welsh Office, Ian Lang, Scotland. Um, so you, you set out there clearly to the Chief Secretary your um, decision um, that the policy should now change. In terms of the financing of it... But, uh, just yes. uh, my hope that the policy would change, not entirely up to me. Because you need money. And permission, yeah. Um, and the permission was the permission to spend money yes. even from within the yes. department, even from within the department's own budget. Oh. Um, uh, now here you you say you're prepared to pay a third, you, um, but you're asking for a treasury contribution from the reserve. Was that, as it were, a, an opening gambit in terms of discussion? Uh, yes. Now I have. No direct memory of this, but I do have direct memory of what I've just said, that we had secured overall a good press settlement. Um, so the, the resource across the department was, a, I'm not saying in those tough times was, but it was a little, it, it wasn't relaxed, but it was a little more, it was a little more room for maneuver. Now, I still thought that I should get some support from the reserve, um, and I had a go at that. But in the end, as we know, I, I, I surrendered that point. 
um, if we can just pick matters up uh, with a, 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 an internal Treasury minute, so not one you would have seen at the time, HMTR 603 underscore 043. Um, so this is 3rd of December 1991. Um, it's from Mr. Dixon uh, to Mr. Grice in the Treasury and to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, and we can see it refers in the opening paragraph to your letter to um, uh, Mr. Uh, Meller. I, I'm not going to read through the detail of it. If we could just go to the third page. Wh whose handwriting do we think that um, is? I think that's Mr. Meller's that's handwriting. Mr. Meller, right. Thank you. Yes, I think that must be right. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to just come back to what's said, yeah. said there. Mm. Um, um, I'll, I'll double check that. But yeah, um, I, if we I go, think that's right. If we go to the, the paragraph eight, uh, we can see the recommendation to, to Mr. Meller is, we recommend that you try to dissuade Mr. Waldegrave and colleagues from offering a compensation scheme. It may seem attractive to him in the short term, but in the longer term, it could cost much more by leading to a no-fault compensation scheme, even if one restricted to medical negligence. Um, uh, so that's the, the suggestion is, is Mr. Miller tries to talk you out of it, um, if I can put it that way. If we go back to the first page and just re read the handwritten entry. Um, this is a long-standing dilemma. It's not comfortable to deny compensation to this group when the haemophiliacs can get it. But giving compensation to them would mean another long stride down the slippery slope to no-fault compensation generally. I am afraid, therefore, our advice has to be against it. As I say, I'll, I'll, I'll check um, who's and handwriting I, I, this is. I think you're right. But... Um, so that, that's the, the, the internal response from the Treasury. Um, can I then just pick up a handful of further de, um, Department of Health documents before asking you a little more generally about it? So we get to DHSC 0002931 underscore 005. Now this is a minute from um, Mr. France. So it's from the Permanent Secretary, Sir 2nd of December. Sir Christopher, Sir Christopher France, yes, sorry. 2nd of December 1991 to your private office. And if we go down to the text of it, it says, I've seen Mr. Heppel's minute of the 29th of November. I very much share his, misgiving, his misgivings on the policy case for a concession here, and the finance would not be easy either. It is never very comfortable to resist claims for compensation from those who have encountered major problems through no fault of their own or anyone else. But unless government is prepared to draw a line and stick to it, it will end up with a de facto very expensive no fault compensation system. The ring fence around the haemophiliacs is bound to be attacked, but we are unlikely ever to find a better one if we abandon it. The haemophiliacs were doubly disadvantaged by their existing hereditary disease, which already affected their position on employment insurance and the like. They can be separated from other victims of medical accidents, but the next defensible boundary is not easy to see. I advise long reflection before we move further into no-fault compensation for medical accidents. Is this really the most pressing marginal case for the deployment of money from the health programme? Um, now, you, you've told us you would have regular meetings, the top of the office meetings, with um, Sir Christopher and, and, and uh, uh, others. Uh, this is, I think, one of the, perhaps the only example we have of, of Sir Christopher putting his views on this issue in writing. Does the fact that it was set out in this formal way rather than simply being conveyed to you in your weekly meetings a reflection uh, of uh, the extent to which he was opposed to your proposal? Yes, it's a very important intervention from him, which I would have taken extremely seriously, as I did take extremely seriously. I thought that, as I, I won't go over what I said yesterday, that the ring fence around those infected with HIV AIDS by the health service was a much clearer and more commonsensical line to defend. Uh, the permanent secretary and the, the deputy secretary, Strawn Heppel, are both advising uh, very strongly against it. I advise long reflection means don't do it. Um, uh, and I would, I would have taken that extremely seriously because um, uh, Sir Christopher was doing his duty uh, at, to, to put, as he saw it, a case against a minister 
uh, embarking on a piece of expenditure that he thought might be wrong. It's not far from the ultimate weapon that a permanent secretary has of writing to the Public Accounts Committee, as happened, for example, in the case of the Pogo Dam, um, when uh, uh, Douglas Heard gave foreign aid to Malaysia. That is the ultimate um, uh, uh, thing, and it goes straight to Parliament. Now, it's not quite that, but it's only one step down. So I would have taken this very seriously, and that is why, after this, I took the trouble to get on paper all the opinions of my other ministers um, to see whether they thought I'd gone completely mad. Um, and one of them did, but the others didn't. And we'll just look briefly at that to complete the paper trail. DHSC 0002537 underscore 063. It's a minute of the 5th of December from your private office mm. to the private offices of your three ministers. The Secretary of State has noted the Permanent Secretary's minute of 2nd of December to me uh, and would appreciate your minister's views. I think the date is wrong, but I don't think anything turns on that. So, um, uh, the, I think you, think you, you probably anticipated my question in your, in your last answer. Mm. Th this seems quite an unusual step to be formally yes. seeking the views of, yes. of, of your uh, ministerial colleagues, mm. but it reflects the fact that you had your permanent secretary and other senior civil yes. servant opposed to the suggested change of line. Yes. Uh, and then, uh, as you say, in terms of the responses, um, DHSC 0002537 underscore 062. Baroness Hooper, PSL, on the 5th of December, her view coincided with that of Mr. Heppel and with the Permanent Secretary. Mm -hmm. So she says, I think we should hold the line, however difficult this may be. I am not aware of a sudden pressure via correspondence or otherwise. Um, but I think both um, the Minister of State and Mr. Dorrell um, took, uh, um, as it were, uh, fell on, on your side of the line. So if we say DHSC 0002938 underscore 004. This is the 10th of December, uh, and it's on behalf of MSH, so uh, Mrs. Bottomley. Paragraph 2, MSH commented that she has always been cautious in this area for the reasons outlined in Permanent Secretary's Minute of 2nd December. However, given the current circumstances, she supports moves seeking a further extension. So Mrs Bottomley agreed with your proposal, essentially. And then if we look at Mr Dorrell's response, PSH, DHSC 0002537 underscore 242. Eleventh of December, PSH has seen your minute of the fifth of December, asking for his views on permanent secretary's minute of second December. He has commented, without enthusiasm, I am in favour of extending the concession to blood transfusion, etc. Victims, the initial concession was a political fix. This would simply redefine what is essentially the same fix. Um, it might be said to be a reluctant agreement. A reluctant but not approval. I I don't want to make a speech about this, but um, it's perhaps rather difficult today um, to uh, enter into an essay defending the trade of politics. But the, I don't regard political as a bad word in a democracy. It, it, it means that it's best that you have taken into account or as many views as you can and come to a decision. Um, the trade of politics sh should be and is an honorable one. So uh, uh, certainly Mr. Dorrell is using the word as a bit of a boo word there, but I, I, would, have, I would have bridled at that a bit and, and thought and responded, I think, that the job of the Secretary of State was to try to take into account all the arguments put externally and internally and come to a conclusion. And if that's politics, that's politics. Um, and then if we just pick matters up in your statement, please, WYTN 528801. Um, if we go to 
page 88, it's paragraph 4.125. Um, and you say this, um, uh, and, and it's referring to Christopher France's yeah. um, advice. While I do not now actively remember seeing this advice, I would certainly have done so at the time. This was advice coming from, respectively, the permanent secretary, so Sir Christopher France, and the deputy secretary, grade two civil servant, that's Strawn Heppel, heading the policy area, both of whom had put their advice in formal minutes. The inquiry asks why I rejected their advice. They were right to warn me in the terms they did, and I would have taken very serious note of their advice. I would have been well aware of the dangers of widening the policy, and their advice would appropriately have been a forceful reminder of those risks. Ultimately, however, it was for ministers to judge the balance of risks. Here, the balance was between trying to maintain the distinction between haemophiliacs and blood transfusion patients, both infected with HIV by NHS treatment, which the Court of Public Opinion rejected, versus the weakening of the defences against pressure for no-fault compensation, which we believe to be an unacceptable outcome for the reasons agreed by Parliament put forward in opposition to Rosie Barnes' bill. Such difficult judgments are, I think, the essence of democratic government. Just as my senior officials were right to warn, I think that the government was right to concede and run the risk on the no-fault compensation concerns. As I was later to express it to the Chief Secretary, I believed it was politically and morally the correct course. I was very aware of the particular stigma and fear that surrounded AIDS at the time, and I did see this as a potentially distinguishing feature from other cases raised in the debate on no fault compensation. Um, the, uh, the balance that you, you identify there, the balance of risks being a matter for ministers to judge, presumably, and th th this is a, a more general question, Lord Waldegrave, the more senior the minister, the, the, the easier or perhaps the less difficult it may be um, for that minister to consider but reject the advice of senior officials. Yes, the Secretary of State should take great care. Um, uh, Secretaries of State come and go. The officials have the corporate memory of the department uh, and are an essential, when, when it comes to the legitimacy of spending, for example, they are the guardians of the public uh, good. And they have, a, as I say, the um, Public Accounts Committee route to, to, to go down. Now, in a, this is not that case. It's a matter where I balance the risks differently for them from them. A, a Secretary of State is also, remember, not just the head of his or her department, but a member of the co collectivity of the cabinet of the government and has a, a duty to look to the wider interests of the government as well as his own or her own department. And you say in your statement that l looking at the documents, you think the initiative to change course was probably your initiative? Well, there were, there were campaigners out there. Yes. There were the redoubtable campaigners from Liverpool. Um, uh, uh, but I think it was, yes. Yes, in, in terms of within government, yes. it was your, your um, initiative as yes. Secretary of State. Um, and then um, I just wanted to ask you to look at, at what you say about your thinking in paragraph 4.119 of your statement. So it's page 86, please, Lawrence. Um, you say, um, picking it up in the fourth line, the reality was that the combined increased pressure in Parliament, questions, motions and debates, from the media campaign and from allied correspondents, led me to judge that the government's position was not sustainable. We had tried the policy of holding the line, protecting the ring fence, and it was not convincing public opinion or parliament. The increasing unpopularity of our stance was, in one sense, useful because it was a lever that I could deploy with the Treasury and others to try to change the policy with which I had become uncomfortable. Hence my warning that if we continue to refuse any help, there is a real prospect that the campaign will gather pace mm and become a damaging and running sore over the next few months. Uh, again, is, that, is, is there anything you have to add to that, or, or is that the best explanation of...? Well, I think only that the, I think the papers show that as, as far back as April, and even earlier than that, I was uncomfortable yes. with it before public campaigning had got going. The, the issue of campaigning uh, um, and so on is 
one of the things that a minister has to judge all the time, because there are hundreds of campaigns going at any one time. I remember as a, as a new MP, I can't remember now what the campaign was, but my constituency secretary said, we've got a huge campaign. We've had 100 letters on something. We have 70,000 constituents. How do you know whether that really represents? So you have to try and judge. I was by no means diminishing campaigning. It's a vital part of our democracy, but you have to judge. I mean, I suppose the greatest, by far the greatest and most effective single issue campaign of my lifetime was one which we'll have to wait for my, my grandchildren to judge whether it was right or not, which was the Brexit campaign. So one has to try and judge these things. Campaigners are a vital part of democracy, but you have, they are one, one element to take into account. W would it be right to look at it in, in, in this way, perhaps? One of the reasons why, in, in relation to this particular issue, um, the campaign may have provided the, the tipping mm. point or, or given mm. you the, the um, uh, uh, weaponry to, to mm. take to the Treasury um, was because you yourself were not convinced mm. of the sustainability and logic of the underlying ring fence. The I underlying think that's line. exactly right. I think I mentioned yesterday that it says in one of the newspaper articles <laughs> that one of the campaigning solicitors took the same view. Let's get the haemophiliac matter settled and then we'll start campaigning on the other one. Um, perhaps I'm, I'm now, I, I, can't, I can't guarantee this from memory, but maybe I thought in somewhat the same way. Um, now, now we saw reference to um, uh, letters being copied to the Scottish office, Welsh office and Northern Ireland office. Um, and, and again, really for the sake of completeness and, and because it's one of the few instances where we have direct evidence mm. of their, um, their involvement, if we can just look at the communications um, from those ministers. I think this was much, uh, I, I, perhaps because I, there was more time, but there was a much better order in all this, and I think I'd got them on side <laughs> um, as allies. Um, so if we start with the Scottish office, SCGV 00002370072, underscore This is the 17th of December 1991, and it's Ian Lang, Secretary of State for Scotland, writing to Mr. Mellor, uh, copied to you. Uh, he says, I've seen a copy of William Waldegrave's letter of the 2nd of December to you about those non-haemophiliac patients infected with HIV in the course of treatment, and I support his proposals for a settlement. I, too, would favour the second option of linkage with the McFarlane Trust, as this is the cleaner solution. There is much public sympathy in Scotland for the handful of cases here and much will be made if we continue to present an unsympathetic response. These unfortunate people will eventually be forced into court. At least two cases in Scotland have now applied for legal aid, and there could be damaging publicity at each stage of the legal process. While it is difficult to estimate the total Scottish costs, it seems on present information likely to be around £900,000. Like William, I would be prepared to find a third of these costs if the Treasury would meet the balance from the Reserve. An early decision in principle on funding would be helpful. Um, so that, that's Scotland. Uh, in terms of the Welsh office, DHSC 00002717 underscore 014. Second of January 1992, um, from uh, David uh, Hunt, Secretary of State for Wales. He refers to having seen copies of your letter and of Ian Lang's letter, and then says this. I too would support these proposals for a settlement through the McFarlane Trust and would be prepared to make a similar contribution in the current financial year if you are able to meet the balance from the reserve. On the basis of the costs in William's letter and in line with our contribution to the earlier settlement, Welsh costs are likely to be around £200,000. If you are able to agree, our officials can discuss how contributions should be made. And then to complete the geographical picture, um, if we go to... HMTR 603 underscore 047. We have here from the Northern Ireland office, um, this is addressed to you, 27th of December. Thank you for sending me a copy of your letter on the 2nd of December to David Meller about financial help for non-haemophiliac patients, um, etc. 
I feel there is little public understanding or sympathy for the government's position on this matter and that the campaign for a settlement is likely to gather momentum in the months ahead. I would therefore support the proposal to recognise the needs of these unfortunate people and their families by settling on the same basis as for haemophiliacs. I'm pleased to say that we are not aware of any non-haemophiliac patients being infected in the course of health service treatment in Northern Ireland, and no costs would fall on our budget at present. If any such cases do come to light in the future, we would of course be prepared to pay an appropriate share of the costs. So it would appear that there was a, um, a, a joined up approach on this issue between the four departments. Yes, I, I think the Treasury would have said um, Secretary of State for Health has squared away his colleagues annoyingly. Um, and then if we just pick it up with the Treasury response uh, to you, uh, HMTR 603 underscore 051. Um, so this is the 13th of January 1992 from Mr Meller. Uh, it refers to your letter and to the letters from Ian Lang, Peter Brook and David Hunt. Uh, and then Mr Meller says this, I understand why you want to provide compensation for this unfortunate group and I sympathise. But I also have serious reservations about whether it would be possible realistically to ring fence any such compensation. There are a range of other groups who have also suffered as a result of treatment under the NHS where there's no question of negligence. By compensating those acquiring HIV from blood transfusion, we will be taking a further long stride towards no-fault compensation in general. Virginia Bottomley put forward a good defence of our current position in the adjournment debate called by Gavin Strang on the 20th of December. It would be difficult to reverse our position so soon after that clear statement. But I also have to say that all this is overtaken by the extent of doctors and dentists overpayments in the current year. You will appreciate that the latest news about the further overpayments to dentists this year has come as a very unpleasant shock. Your officials have now told mine that the gross overpayment to dentists this year is likely to be a staggering £8,000 per dentist at the very least. That comes to well over £100 million, which you will be looking to me to provide from the reserve. I have also learnt from officials that there will be claims for overpayments this year from Scotland and Wales. It brings the cumulative overpayment to doctors and dentists to over half a billion pounds more than the total increases many colleagues received in their 1991 survey settlements. In these circumstances, you leave me no room to help you or the other health departments by providing additional access to the reserve for the blood transfusion patients. I cannot therefore agree to what you propose. And I think there's an important point here, because we're sliding about as to whether it's just access to the reserve yes. or agreement. I think he's saying no, which is what he wrote in... in um, and, and uh, on the minute, uh, I cannot agree to what you propose. I think that means no. And, and so, he's, he's, on any view, he's clearly saying no, no to access reserve. to the reserve. Yeah. You understood this as also saying no to your, in the sense of you using Department of Health monies. Well, again, I, it's not a, a, a direct recollection un, unaided, but I would have read that, I think, my officials would have read that as saying no. I cannot agree to what you propose. Um, and just picking up on the question of, of when Treasury agreement was required to, um, to departmental expenditure, um, and leaving aside what you said about the extent to which perhaps mm. modest payments from the personal mm. fund could mm. be used without tre mm. Treasury um, agreement, mm. um, was it the case that any expenditure from departmental monies that had not been itemised as part of the bid um, um, and the annual settlement had to get Treasury approval? Well, if it had implications, certainly if it had implications, yes, in principle. Um, de minimis, really de minimis, perhaps no, but where there were implications, there were implications here of, of contingent liabilities and so on, as we learn later on, that was certainly you needed um, permission from the Treasury, yes. Uh, and, and the, the reference there to contingent liabilities, that is, as I understand it, is a reference to the fact that because there was uncertainty yes. about the possibility of future claimants. Right. There was a possibility of future expenditure. That was something that had to be notified formally to Parliament, um, yeah. and that's why the Treasury yeah. approval would be... Well, that, that would be uh, an additional reason that they were unhappy about this. Um, if we then, I think, um, pick matters up, um, th there's an... 
there's an internal um, uh, Treasury m minute, but I think that's um, an, an not something you'd have seen at the time. So for the, for the reference, for, sorry, for the transcript, I'll just give the reference. HMTR 3051180005. underscore 005. It's a minute of the 5th of December 1992. Um, uh, um, uh, Su suggesting that the Chief Secretary might agree if it was to come entirely from departmental funds. Um, but if we can then look at... Um, DHSC 0002585 underscore 017... Um, this is a, a minute from Mr. Schofield to your private office, 6th of February 1992. Uh, and we can see reference in the first paragraph um, to uh, the fact that there'd been a meeting between the Prime Minister and a group of senior Conservative MPs where Mr. Major agreed to consider further the question of financial help for people infected with HIV. Uh, and there's reference to a request for a progress report. And we've, we've looked at this with, with um, Sir John um, Major. Um, there is then detail of um, how the money might be found departmentally. I'm not going to read through the details of that. If we go over the page, um, uh, if we pick it up under the heading ring fencing at the bottom of the page, we can see it says both the Prime Minister and the Chief Secretary have emphasised the need to establish a robust position on ring fencing. This is difficult as a settlement now for recipients of HIV infected blood and tissue following public clamour may well encourage claims from those damaged by hepatitis, CJD or other medical accidents. Ministers will be seen as susceptible to public pressure if only it is intense enough. Ministers will be more vulnerable on the no-fault compensation issue. On the other hand, if a line has to be drawn on which to stand ground, the distinction between recipients of factor rate and whole blood is proving a very weak position to defend and there is little public understanding or sympathy for the department's position. Compensation for HIV-infected patients from the non-haemophiliac group would at least be limited to cases where HIV infection likely to lead to fatal illness has been brought about through NHS treatment. Um, and then if we go to the next page, uh, picking up in paragraph 9, I said paragraph 8, sorry, just refers to um, officials having been working on how, how a scheme could um, operate and then nine, if the Prime Minister does intervene to break the impasse with the Chief Secretary, Ministers will wish to decide when and how to make an announcement. There are no new factors which can be drawn on to justify a change of policy. Ministers may therefore have to say they're respecting the overwhelming wishes of members of the House. And, and there is the clear understanding of the Department of Health, which would have been my understanding, that there was an impasse with the Chief Secretary. And the Prime Minister once again came to my rescue um, as he did before, and I think came to the rescue of the victims concerned. Um, uh, and we can then, I think, see you wrote to the Prime Minister, 7th of February 1992, HMTR 603 um, we, we looked at this uh, with Sir John, um, but I think perhaps worth looking again um, briefly with you. So paragraph one refers to the, the meeting that Sir John had had with, with Conservative Party members. It refers to a meeting you had had with MPs, and you refer to the strength of feeling the issue was causing across all parties. Paragraph two refers to the proposals you'd put to the Chief Secretary, and you say for reasons which I well understand he did not feel able to agree. Uh, however, given the mounting parliamentary and public concern, I believe we should reconsider my proposals. And then you set out three elements um, Similar money as, as with the uh, haemophilia um, scheme. Uh, you then propose a, a panel to handle decisions on individual cases determining eligibility. And thirdly, the undertaking not to pursue legal action. Paragraph five, we must recognize the risk of weakening our general opposition to no-fault compensation. Uh, the Chief Secretary is rightly concerned about this. Well, we should have to make plain we're responding as with the haemophiliacs to very special circumstances, but that our general policy remains firm. And then top of the next page, you say, given the other claims in my budget, I cannot meet all the cost of around £12 million. I can, however, find £3 million myself in this year and next and would want an equal sum each year from the reserve. 
um, should the cases be settled at a faster rate than I anticipate, I would hope to be able to use some of the second year's money this year. I am copying this minute only to the Chief um, Secretary. Um, now, I think the Chief Secretary line of not using the reserve was maintained. Mm. Um, but is it, is it your understanding, your evidence, that effectively the, the intervention of the Prime Minister enabled there to be agreement that the policy would change, but with the department funding exactly. scheme. Um, and I, I don't think we need to go to the, all of the further documents, but there's a, again, for the transcript, you, you wrote to Mr. Mellor on the 12th of February, um, it's DHSC 00025820 underscore 003, in which you explained you, you'd look at the programme to, to work out where you would find um, the money from, and then there's, there's some some additional correspondence on that, which I don't think we need to look at. If we then just come to the announcement in Parliament um, to complete the chronological picture, it's at DHSC 000 3625 040. It's a written answer 17th of February 1992, um, and if we just go down to uh, your response to the, the question, um, you say, pursuant to the reply of 14th of November 1991 at column 656, I have decided that the special provision already made for those with haemophilia and HIV is to be extended to those who have been infected with HIV as a result of National Health Service blood transfusion or tissue transfer in the United Kingdom, the payments will also apply to any of their spouses, partners and children to whom their infection may have been passed on. The rates of payment are shown in the table. Similar help will be available throughout the UK. The government have never accepted the argument for a general scheme of no-fault compensation for medical accidents, as such a scheme would be unworkable and unfair. That remains our position. We made special provision for those with haemophilia and HIV because of their very special circumstances. It has been argued that this special provision should be extended to include those who have become infected with HIV through blood or tissue transfer within the UK. I have considered very carefully all the circumstances and the arguments which have been put to us. I have concluded that it would be right to recognise that this group, who share the tragedy of those with haemophilia in becoming infected with HIV through medical treatment within the UK, is also a very special case. And then over the page... The circumstances of each infected transfusion or tissue recipient will need to be considered individually to establish that their treatment in the UK was the source of their infection. The next paragraph then deals with the establishment of the panel and the work on, on the mechanics of, of, of dealing with claims. The third paragraph explains that parliamentary authority for making these payments will be sought through supplies estimates and the Confirming Appropriation Act. On the basis of the reported cases, the estimated cost could be £12 million, However, I cannot be certain about the cost as numbers of valid claims are not known. And that picks up upon the issue we discussed a, 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 a few minutes ago, yeah. the, the contingent liability, the yeah. future uncertain liability. I share the great sympathy which is universally felt for the blood and tissue recipients who have tragically become infected through their treatment. Money cannot compensate for this, but I hope that the provision we are making will provide some measure of financial security for those affected and, and their families. So we can see it... it it, it, it essentially takes to February 1992 for the position to be formally and publicly um, um, uh, changed. Um, looking, looking back at it now, why did it take that length of time and did it take too long? Why it took that length of time, I think, was that it took that length of time to... to um, overcome the arguments of precedent, which were real. Um, I'm sure the campaign has helped, um, but I think I found, and I believed myself, thinking about it all the time, that the, 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 just was, the, the, the HIV AIDS ring fence, if you like, was a far more logical and stronger one, because that was what had driven my uh, commitment to this case in the first place um, from personal experience and other experience. One knew the stigma and, and all that. I won't repeat what I said yesterday. Could it have been done earlier and better? I'm sure that 
uh, uh, um, I'm sure that, that you know someone um, could have done better than I could. I'm sure, um, but I did manage to change both policies within just about a, a year, and I think that was not too bad in the circumstances of the time. Um, uh, uh, it's, it, uh, so I, I can't really answer more than to say I, I, I did it as quickly as I thought I could. And if, if, we, if we leave to one side, mm. you may say it's a big thing to leave to one side, but the, the financial issue, yeah. the issue of, of needing to secure um, the uh, Treasury agreement mm. and to, to persuade the Treasury, mm. and just look at it as a matter of, of, of principle, was there ever a good reason for the initial ring fence excluding those infected through transfusion? Well, the, the original ring fence had derived from uh, way back from 87, or way back, some years back. The ring fence then made um, around the haemophilia case, which had been made strongly. Um, that, that ring fence had its defenders to the, to the, to the end, as we, uh, we've seen. I simply thought that it wasn't the best place to put the, the, the necessary ring fence. Um, and of course, officials in my department and in the Treasury were against moving, uh, and very strongly against moving at all for, for reasons of the dangers that they saw, which I, I don't think were fulfilled, but that's for subsequent history. Now, um we, we've seen a couple of references in the materials to the fear that um, moving, moving the ring fence may lead to further campaigns or further claims, um, including for those infected with hepatitis. Um, and, and there are also references to other cases, human growth hormone and, and, and others. I, I think it's right from the documents that um, it, during the time you were at the Department of Health, neither officials nor you um, gave any um, express consideration to the provision of financial support for those infected in the same way as the mm -hmm. cohort we're talking mm -hmm. about, blood products or blood transfusion, mm -hmm. with hepatitis C. No, that, that wasn't a, an issue brought to my attention. Um, can I then move um, um, ra rather more shortly to uh, the question of uh, screening of blood donations mm. for hepatitis mm. C. I, I'm only going to show you one document because this wasn't an issue um, in, in which the documents came to your office. Um, to, just to illustrate the issue, if we go to PRSE 0004667. Um, so this is a, a document we've, we've looked at um, uh, in the inquiry uh, uh, already um, with other witnesses, 21st of December 1990. Uh, it's a submission from Mr. Canavan to the Chief Medical Officer and to PSL, so Baroness um, Hooper. Uh, it's headed Hepatitis C Antibody Screening Test, Advisory Committee on the Virological Safety of Blood, ACBSB. Um, and it, um, you'll see the recommendation in paragraph two it's recommended that screening should be introduced as a public health measure. The other UK health ministers are also being asked to improve the introduction of screening in their transfusion services. So that refers again to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, I think. Um, now, um, you, you, you're, you are aware now, I think, of, uh, amongst other things, um, the decision of Mr Justice Burton mm -hmm. in, a, in a later okay. judgment. I'm not going to be asking you about the, the, the details of that. But is it right to understand that this issue, this issue about the when screening for hepatitis C should be introduced into the transfusion service, was not an issue upon which you were asked to make any decision during your time as Secretary of State? I certainly don't remember it, and the, the, the papers seem to show that I wasn't involved. Um, oh, we can take the document down. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, do, do you... Um, other than the references we've seen to hepatitis as something that can be transmitted and, and the, the, the potential concern about the ring fence, do, do you recall um, uh, what your um, state of knowledge was about the, the risks of hepatitis, hepatitis C in particular, and, and its potential seriousness? I, I don't, I'm afraid. I, I, I do remember 
I mean, it was referred to there that uh, the, there was a new strain. I don't, it was because it was referred to non-A, non-B for a long time. There were, there were new things being discovered, but I don't have uh, any direct knowledge of it now. Um, now you, you told us in your statement, and we touched on it yesterday, that in terms of the, the triggers for issues that might, mm. you might expect to come to the Secretary mm. of State as opposed to be dealt with mm -hmm. by other ministers or, or, or officials, um, one of those would be issues of major public health concern. Mm -hmm. it, it might be said that making the blood supply safer mm -hmm. by pre introducing a test to prevent um, the transmission of, of hepatitis C was an issue of major public health concern. Does it surprise you, looking at it now, that this was not an issue that, that, that was brought to your attention at the time? Well, uh, reading the papers now, the initial decision is taken as an obvious one. Um, let's get on with it, and they say, let's do it, um, I, I can't I remember, it'll be done by spring or... Yeah, um, something to that effect. Um, and then there's, I read, the um, issues about prototypes and new kinds of tests and too many false positives and so on, and it doesn't take, it doesn't arrive until September. Now, uh, it's impossible for me, without really investigating that, to know whether all that was uh, uh, reasonable or, or whether... Uh, the junior minister or, or the officials should have raised uh, their hands and said there's something going wrong here. I, I, um, I, don't, I don't want to judge them without having much more knowledge of that. Okay. And, and, and it's right to say that you have not been provided with all of the copious documentation about the committee's decision making and which bits did go to ministers mm. and which did not because none of it was mm. brought to your attention at the time. It, it's more the just a general question. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm deliberately. I'm not asking mm. you to pass judgment because mm. you mm. haven't been provided with the material and the, the inquiry mm. and other witnesses have. It's just more the, the general question. And knowing what you know about about the department, about what were matters of concern, um, 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 is is the issue one that, given its importance in public health terms, should have come to your attention at, at some stage as Secretary of well, State? Do you think? Uh, 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 I don't think the original easy decision to press on, um, to do it, that needn't have come to me because it was an obvious decision to take on the advice given to the, uh, uh, to the parliamentary secretary and to the officials. It, if there had been thought to be a serious uh, uh, a muddle or mishap or delay of some kind that, that needed uh, the impetus of the Secretary of State to sort out, that should have come to me. But I don't see uh, evidence for that in the papers. I mean, I, but without great in the papers I've seen. Um, can, can I then turn um, to, to a, just a, a handful of broader I I issues? Um, one of the concerns about the establishment of precedent um, and the uh, impact in terms of a, the policy against no fault compensation was based on an assumption that there was no fault involved on the part of the NHS mm. or on, on government. I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. yep. um, it, could the department, could government more generally, or, or, or the NHS know that there was nothing, that there was no fault, leave aside legal liability, no fault or lessons to be learnt, nothing that could be done to improve public health without undertaking some form of investigation or inquiry? It's a very difficult question to answer that. The, the um, press of continuing events uh, mean that there's a limited capacity to go back and review all the time previous decisions, unless uh, a, a weighty voices had been saying that there was a, a serious mistake earlier. If that had been so, the whole approach to this would have been different. But no such voices were heard by me, at least. Um, and then... It, it, the concept of, of reflective learning mm. is, is a, it's, it's an important concept mm. in the modern NHS. It's important for healthcare mm. professionals, for NHS bodies. Yeah. What, what about for government departments, ministers and civil servants? Um, what, and this is, really a, this is a general question to you, Lord Wardlegrave, building upon your, your years in, 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 in politics. How can governments learn from mistakes, if, particularly if they don't ever learn about them? Mm. 
Well, if they never learn about them, they're never going to learn from them, certainly. So uh, going back to my evidence to the BSE inquiry, uh, the necessary openness, the necessary involvement of, of voices outside, expert voices outside as well as inside. In one sense, it goes right back to my first job in the Cabinet Office in the Central Policy Review Staff, part of whose mission was to try to take a step back and look at policy as it developed and look both forwards and backwards and to involve outsiders. Um, that, that's a very important aspect of the improvement of government, I think. Um, I, I wrote a minute then, which I find to my great alarm, I was only 20-something, had been sent by my boss straight to the Prime Minister saying, um, uh, William Walgrave has written an attached minute saying we should be much more open about things and give proper press conferences and publish much more policy documentation. I found rather alarmingly that Mr. Heath had had this document um, from this very young person put it on his desk. I don't know what he did with it. Um, but I've always believed in, in that. We've made great steps since. Um, and uh, we, But I'm giving a, a rather poor answer, I'm afraid, but I think the key, particularly in science-heavy departments, is the involvement across the board of expertise inside and outside the department, which involves openness of policy analysis, not policy decisions. I'm a defender of the idea that ministers and their immediate civil servants should be allowed to discuss all issues in some privacy, at the time at any rate. But the, what underlies policy in terms of factual analysis and scientific analysis should be made as open as possible. And then just picking up on that theme of openness, some of the documents we've looked at um, might suggest a degree of preoccupation with how to mm. present decisions yes. so as to avoid criticism or fallout yeah. or adverse press comment or ad adverse publicity. How, how, how does that fit with openness? Well, it's, it's difficult. Um, we are a democracy, so all the time you're in a, a, a conversation, an argument with the public and with experts and with the, uh, the, the opposition in Parliament if they're doing their job properly. So, of course, you're looking to put your best foot forward and to put your case in the strongest way. Um, but you must never stray over the line of suppressing things which ought to be made available to make that debate a proper debate. Um, easy to say, but not always easy to judge at the time. Governments, um, and I promise this is a question I drafted in advance and not prompted by recent events, governments seem to find it sometimes hard to say we got things wrong. Um, uh, uh, and um, it could be said, for example, announcing the HIV um, mm -hmm. Uh, transfusion decision in, in, in February 1992, a, a full answer um, or full explanation, full press release could have been, you know, we, we drew a line here, in retrospect that was a mistake, mm. we're now rectifying that mistake. Um, wh wh why is it that sometimes governments, departments, ministers find it so difficult to say that something has gone wrong? And, and do you have any reflections as to how that could be altered or improved? Well, in a relatively long and not always successful political career, I suppose um, uh, the problem is of, an, of, a, of an, any adversarial system, I don't know whether the same exists in court, but our parliament is a high court, as people say, that if you say, I got it wrong. The other side says, well, well you're no use then, are you? You just get things wrong. They very seldom say, uh, well done, you've, you've um, admitted a fault, and let's go on to the next argument. They simply say, that fellow Walgrave admitted he got that wrong, so he's probably getting this wrong. Um, but there are times when you have to try it, and the, the greatest, much greater politicians than I can do it. Um, and when it is inevitable, it must be done um, because uh, one thinks of the extreme situations in the war and so forth. Uh, the British government in the Second World War, on the whole, admitted when things were going wrong and therefore uh, retained the trust of um, the people for the next stage. 
those are great issues far higher than I was ever involved with, but the principle, I think, must be the same. But it takes skill and confidence. Um, and very, very good politicians um, of my time could do it, say we got that policy wrong, but this is why we did it, and this is what we're going to do instead. Um, and sometimes they can take the public with them. But it takes skill, and it takes confidence to do that. And you won't get any thanks from the opposition. They will say, well, you're just the hopeless. You just get everything wrong. Um, so those are the questions I was proposing to ask Lord Waldegrave. Um, so if we could now take a break, uh, and that we can, can be our normal morning break, but that will provide the opportunity for further lines of questions if, uh, to be suggested. Yes, certainly. Let, let me uh, explain. You, you, you may know already, but let, if, um, if so, forgive me for repeating it. But the inquiry works because there are a number of participants, um, core participants, uh, are, re are often represented by uh, legal representatives uh, and have a right through those representatives to put questions for counsel to ask you. Obviously, they have to have a proper chance to do that. That involves uh, really the questions being formulated at the end of what else you have had to say because then they'll know what might be missing. Um, and to give that a, a proper opportunity, uh, they will take a, a break, and uh, if I say, uh, how long do you think you might need? Um, possibly, quite possibly only 30 minutes, but if we said 40 minutes, I think that would undoubtedly be ample. Yes, yeah, so if we, we come back then at quarter to 12, or not, shall I say not before quarter to 12, you'll be told if there's a, a need for more time, uh, and I can't tell you how long the... Uh, session will be after that. It may be short, it may be long, it depends how many questions there are. Um, but that's what we'll do. So quarter to 12, not before quarter to 12. <laughs> 